Top Med Talk. Welcome to Top Med Talk. This is part two of our two part series on anesthesiology, the annual general meeting for the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Top Med Talk has a long and proud association with the ASA. Over the years, we have brought you exclusive coverage of the meetings. This program looks back at some of the most popular pieces we've done on Top Med Talk at the ASA. Coming up, we're going to be speaking about the push toward briefing the public about perioperative hypotension. We'll be reflecting on a hugely important trial, which should come as a relief to all practicing anesthesiologists. And we'll be discussing the Perioperative Quality Initiative. Find out how it can help you to provide safe and effective value-based care. And also how the ASA provides opportunities for its members to do more, particularly in the area of leadership. Before that, though, we'll start with a conversation we had with the ever popular TJ Gann here on Top Med Talk. I'm currently professor and chair at Stony Brook University in Long Island, New York. This piece took place at Anesthesiology 2021, where we discussed the fourth consensus guidelines for the management of post-operative nausea and vomiting, developed to provide perioperative practitioners with comprehensive and up-to-date evidence-based guidance on the risk, stratification, prevention and treatment of post-operative nausea and vomiting in both adults and children. TJ Gann tells us more. TJ, um, we, we've talked about a little bit about those guidelines just for everybody if they want to get a hold of those because I know they came out during COVID and were maybe overshadowed just a little bit. So where, where do we find all of that? Yeah, so the as is any consensus guideline is only useful if you update it regularly. Yes. So we published our first one in 2003 and every four or five years we publish an update. So the most recent one is the fourth update which was published last year in Anesthesia Analgies. They want a premier anesthesia journal in the August issue. So and also this is available no charge. Free. It's an, uh, free access to anyone who wants to use it Go to ANA website and you can click for the full version of the guidelines. And in addition to that, with the publication of that guidelines, we also have a program where we can give what we call virtual grand rounds. So if your mm. institution would like for an expert to present the guidelines, you can go to a CME website called CINEMED, so C-I-N-E-M-E-D.com forward slash P-O-N-V. Yeah. And there you can request for a program and register for it. And we can provide a uh, virtual grand round. There's no cost to the institution or the participant. Brilliant. We're, we're getting ready to do this, actually, TJ. So I'm looking forward <laughs> to hearing more. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> looking forward to it. The link to the fourth consensus guidelines is available in the show notes. This next piece was released in October of 2021. And it's a conversation with Mary Dale Peterson. At the time, she was the immediate past president of the ASA. Here, she speaks about the opportunities the ASA provides for people who want to learn more about leadership. I mean, we have some great programs. We have the Kellogg School. It's a leadership program. That's kind of a shorter term course. We have a partnership with the American College of Healthcare Executives, um, you know, of which, which I'm a member. And we're the only specialty organization that has this special partnership. So mm -hmm. you can go to an ASA meeting, either this meeting here or a practice management meeting, and you will be able to get credit with ACHE. And ACHE has just a, a wealth of of speakers and knowledge and educational products to help you in your leadership journey. If people would go to our website and go to our leadership section, you can take the profiles and to see what your strengths and weaknesses are. We all have them. It's all part of that double-edged sword, you know, that you may have with your spouse as well. <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, but, but I think learning about yourself and, and where your weaknesses and strengths are and for me, it's all about making sure that other people, I have people around me that are helping me or supplanting my weaknesses, and then I can use my strengths to support them. And so that's on our website as well. So we have a lot of resources to help you in your leadership journey, no matter if you're starting out as a, a newly minted person in private practice yeah. and want to be a leader in your group or you're a young faculty person or whatever. And don't forget the ASA website is ASAHQ.org. That's ASAHQ.org.
The fuller conversations from which these clips are taken are, of course, available in the show notes. This next piece is taken from 2019 at the ASA. We discussed the Perioptive Quality Initiative. And any chance we get to mention that here on Top Med Talk, we always take it. The reason for that, of course, is because Pokey org is an excellent website and a place where you can make sure that you are delivering safe, effective, value-based care. Here we're speaking to a popular contributor on Top Med Talk, Andrew Shaw, who is the chairman of the Department of Intensive Care and Resuscitation at the Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland, Ohio. He's also a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, a fellow of the Royal College of Anaesthetists, and a fellow of the American College of Critical Care Medicine. Have a listen to what he has to say about the Perioptive Quality Initiative. It's an international, multidisciplinary, not-for-profit organisation whose goal and intent is to improve the quality of perioptive medicine everywhere it's practised, so all around the world. And the mechanism we use to do that is a series of consensus conferences on subjects, on topics of interest related to perioptive medicine and the delivery of perioptive healthcare services. So it grew out of an, a similar acute uh, care initiative initially focused on renal medicine uh, called ADKI, the Acute Dialysis or now Acute Disease Quality Initiative. And we had the idea, I guess about, I don't know, about four years ago now, to do something similar for perioperative medicine. Since then, we have focused on enhanced recovery subjects. We've focused on fluid. We've focused on opioids and pain relief. And our most recent one, non-cardiac surgical acute kidney injury. So the output from all of those conferences is published in the, in the literature. We've got something like 20 or so primary publications and accompanying, all, all open source. And accompanying yeah. editorials. Everything is available on the website, www.pokey.org, so P-O-Q-I dot O-R-G. And... In addition to the, the papers being available, all of the graphics, all of the images are available open source for people to use in their educational programming, their content, their slides. Uh, and that is a, that's a fundamental tenet of the whole Pokey movement is that all of the information is available to anybody open source. But heavy, heavy on infographics. So if you go in there yep. and grab an infographic, permission is automatic. Automatically granted. Um, just please, you know, please, please, <laughs> please, <laughs> please acknowledge and say where it came from. Um, and we do, we negotiate all of those agreements up front prior to the, con- to the conference. And it's really worked well. You, we're starting to see... The, some of the graphics from the earlier meetings yeah. on people's content. I saw one uh, just this morning, um, and oh, it's, it's it's very gratifying to see. Yeah. But, but the, the, you know, the, the old adage "an image captures a thousand words" is yes. really true, and um, and it's been great to see it uh, see it grow and develop. Towards the end of the month, we'll be having an update on the Perioptive Quality Initiative. That's out on October the thirty first. Now, time to have a listen to that trial, which, if you're an anesthesiologist you'll be delighted to hear about. This taken from the ASA coverage of Top Med Talk. It features their guests, Kate Leslie, who at the time is the Honorary Professor of Monash University, Melbourne, Australia, and Timothy Short, who at the time was the Clinical Anaesthetist and Honorary Professor at Auckland University Hospital in New Zealand. I guess, Tim, why don't you introduce the, the article that we are, are going to be discussing and, and um, some of the things we're going to be talking about today? Well, we've just completed a very large study looking at the role of anaesthetic depth and whether it's important in determining outcome after anaesthesia. Is it out yet, officially? Yes, Yes, it was published yesterday in The Lancet, simultaneously with our presentation of it at the breaking trial session here in the the ASA. Fantastic. So we can can deep dive into this. It's all public knowledge now, right? All of it's it's out. Great. And and Tim, Tim, when you say big... Big trials used to be over 100 patients, but you're up into the thousands of this, aren't you? Yes, yes. I mean, this is a study of over 6,500 patients. Uh, It's been conducted over many years, and we've really looked at what we can do to improve outcomes in the sick, older patient. There's been a lot of concern in the literature that we may be over-anaesthetizing elderly patients, and that we, you know, could refine our drug doses and techniques and you know, that anaesthesia has a role in improving the outcome for patients that undergo major surgery, particularly when they're, you know, older and more vulnerable. Now, when they do these um, 
big trials, Tim. Sometimes the criticisms are that there aren't enough centres or there aren't enough countries. But I, I think you, you've, you've checked that off as well, haven't you? This was a, a collaborative trial between many countries and many centres. Yes, we have a very successful clinical trials network that's been run under the auspices of ANSCA and you know, quite a number of staunch collaborators. And this study was done in eight countries, including the United Kingdom, of course, the United States of America, New Zealand, Australia, and Hong Kong, China. So we can say it's generally, we believe these results are applicable to a very broad population. Yes. Yeah. yes. And, and the theory behind it, people would, everyone would be concerned that if you got too much anaesthetic, uh, it might have a long-term effect. And that's mm. the depth thing, is the, depth, yes. the idea that we... Yeah. We have these uh, gases or drugs we give to keep people, what they call asleep, anaesthetized during surgery mm. to render them you know, insensible. And there's been concern based on observations recently that if they were deeper, that they might have a worse outcome, including die more often. That was the core bit. Yes, yes. There's been seven or eight large studies of observational data saying quite a strong association between overly deep anaesthesia and subsequent mortality rates being higher. The question was whether we could improve patients' outcomes by intervening and, you know, quite aggressively targeting a lighter level of anaesthesia and whether such an approach would be safe. And to give the lighter or deeper anaesthesia, we, we now have monitors that tell us about depth of anaesthesia, sensors we can put on. And as I understand the trial, you, you sort of set that at two different levels to get a separation of dose? Yes, yes. I mean, we basically chose two levels. One was at the deeper level where most patients traditionally have probably sat. But now with the depth monitors, we can run people safely at a lighter level of anaesthesia with, we hope, no increased risk of awareness as a result of using less anaesthetic gases. And, uh, if I may, the result... The result. (laughs) Roll, roll, please. (laughs) We looked at a very large number of parameters, but the initial result was essentially the survival of the patient for one year after their major surgery. And we found that there was no difference in outcome between a light level of anaesthesia and a deep level of anaesthesia. But I must predicate that that this was not very deep anaesthesia yes. it was strictly within the bounds of normal clinical practice but i think we defined that our current practice of anaesthesia is essentially safe what i've read of it so far it's sort of deeper anaesthesia versus lighter anaesthesia well, I, can you give us a little yeah. bit of, um, mm. more specifics about that sure so we based the two group uh, depths on a lot of uh, research that had been done previously and also experience in Tim's hospital with their large database. And we worked out that uh, anesthesiologists or anaesthetists tend to um, confine their anaesthetic depth to a a range of between a BIS value of 35 and a BIS value of around 50. A reduction, a uh, one-third reduction in the amount of anaesthetic vapour or sevoflurane or desflurane that's administered to patients in the lighter group. So we, we found that we could get two groups that were acceptable to anaesthetists and that were within the recommended guidelines of the company that produces the monitor and also that were consistent with previous research projects. And so it's a real-world comparison. It's not a comparison, as Tim has already said, between two things that are not normal in clinical practice. So it, it is the main take from it that over quite a range of anaesthetic depth, they're, they're all safe. Is that overstating it? or This was an intention to treat trials. Yes. Uh, the two groups, we intended to have one group with a BIS of 35 and the other with a BIS of 50. And, if, and we took those patients and compared them and there were no differences in mortality between the two groups. So e- equally safe then. We're not saying they're both safe from that perspective. But it equally sounds as though safe, the, yes. the lighter one um, would be more, it would save more money, wouldn't it? And the lighter one, it, you're using less vapour to achieve a similar <laughs> yeah. result. That's, yes, good. That's yeah. good for the planet, isn't it? Well, potentially. Yeah. Um, we're going to do an economic um, sub-study to def- define that more um, precisely. 
Um, there are other possible um, uh, advantages to light anesthesia. Uh, patients wake up uh, more quickly. And also there's uh, literature that shows that uh, there might be a lower rate of delirium. Mm. So we've done a delirium sub-study in 600 of the patients and uh, we're analysing those data now to see um, uh, whether our data are, con- are consistent with those previous studies. So that'll come out soon and we can talk to you again on Top Mid Talk. <laughs> we we'll look forward to it. Yeah, and yeah. That. I think touched a little bit on this in our chat beforehand. People are going to push you to say, what about the extremely deep anaesthetics yeah. that probably occurred? You know, the burst suppression group, as they call it, you know, is... I, I'm, I'm guessing that's going to be a follow-up sub-study as well. Yes, yes. We'll be doing a very detailed analysis of the BIS traces to look for evidence of whether burst suppression is bad for you. Yeah. And this will be very high-resolution data, and I hope it'll answer that question for anaesthetists as well. We're also going to see whether the people who had burst suppression or who were deeply anaesthetised but needed very little anaesthesia to to yeah. become deeply anaesthetised. Um, our colleague Doug Campbell, who was a crucial part of the study, he's going to uh, lead that analysis as well because there's probably a group of very frail people out there who need very little anaesthesia and they might be actually the ones who are having the worst outcomes. Stay with Top Med Talk for more on that one in the future. Now though, let's listen to a slightly longer piece. Here Monty speaks about EPPOM's widely regarded Dingle Conference, which in the past has done a lot to raise the profile of intraoperative hypotension. On the subject of the Dingle Conference, Top Med Talk listeners can expect audio from the most recent manifestation of that conference soon. Make sure you've subscribed so that you can get it straight to your podcast app here on this channel. This clip is our last and it's focused upon something we've been raising awareness about for some time now, both here on Top Med Talk and on a more official level, as you'll hear, with EBPOM, Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine. This conversation features Ashish Khanna, who at the time was the Associate Professor, Section Head for Research, the Department of Anesthesiology and Sectional Critical Care Medicine at Wake Forest School of Medicine. Have a listen. Oh, Monty, what's up, Pam? Huh? <laughs> it's just all you want to take this one? <laughs> so a group of us started evidence-based perioperative medicine 24 years ago. So next year is our 25th anniversary. Our mission statement is on our website, but basically it's trying to bring the world closer to together to discuss perioperative issues. And more recently, we started our broadcasting arm, Top Mid Talk, and that's what we're doing here today. Now, if, if you look around, because you'll be watching this now yeah. in our educational hub, Please do have a look around all of the content there. There's on-demand content that is both video and podcast, and you can follow your way in and find over 1,500 different podcasts, videos, etc. And right at the moment, it is it is free. You can also find a lot of our conversations that we've had over the years, that yeah. we've been doing this for a little while, at topmedtalk.com. And Monty, we, we've had a lot of discussions about the topic that we're going to be um, talking about today, haven't we? We have. We're going to go back to a a favorite of ours, which is, uh, I'm going to say intraoperative hypotension, IOH, but we're going to go beyond that, just to give a little teaser there. (laughs) That's right. That's right. We we talk a lot about it, but I always love our conversations because I still see the excitement whenever, you know, the group gets here and and really starts digging in. And sometimes I'm like, wow, how did we end up (laughs) there at the end of this conversation? It, we get deep sometimes. Exactly. Well, well, one of the, I think, that puts the interest in this in perspective um, is recently we were at our Ireland meeting, mm-hmm. and a part of that we went live to the European Parliament in Brussels, where two MEPs, members of the European Parliament, supported the launch of a document called Improve, which is all about improving surgical outcomes. And the main thrust of it was discussions around intraoperative hypotension. Because part of it, uh, you know, is a sort of think tank that formed and produced this document, was you're telling us that there's loads of this thing happening, and it's associated with harm. Can we have a can we have a bigger discussion about that? You know, it, does that make sense? You know, the sort of saying, "Am I making sense to you there, Saul?" They were sort of saying, "It, it does." I'm I'm just amazed, um, maybe envious, maybe not but amazed that Parliament decided to get into that discussion, into that space. It's the European Parliament, and therefore you can have members of the European Parliament support the launch of a lobbying document. 
that uh, says that this is so they're not there saying that parliament has decided we're going to do something about yeah. this they've said we think that the european parliament should listen closer and we think that this group has articulated something that's worth listening closer to so do you think monty this is one step closer to taking this to the general public i've always advocated that we talk a lot about say cancer chemotherapy it's out on tv and this and that and we don't talk enough about perioperative hypotension to the general public and and the overall the group which is informed by patients and patient advocates said you need to get over yourself in other words you, you know you, you you need to be prepared to talk to the public about it and and that is a challenge that we need to talk through. So, uh, Asish, that if you, uh, that raises a really interesting question to go directly to the public. Um, once upon a time, a little bit still residual uh, um, awareness under anesthesia was was um, sexy to talk about. We we know it's not common. It's real and it's devastating, but it's not common. And yet, that was a direct campaign to go to the public to sort of bring it up from the bottom. Is intraoperative hypotension worthy of that approach? Um, it's, it is common, and it's under-recognized. Right. I mean, if we just take look at the figures, I mean, it's way more common than intraoperative awareness, especially the way Hollywood portrayed it, right? And, you know, after a few movies came out, every one of my patients used to ask me in the pre-op area, will I wake up under anesthesia? That's yeah. the only question they had exactly. for me, yes. right? No one ever asked me, will I, will I be hemodynamically stable? Maybe the day I go under anesthesia, I'm going <laughs> to ask the guys, please, you know, right. this is my sweet blood pressure spot. Keep me there, right? Don't let me be hypotensive. But that's me. The average person, they don't care. They go under anesthesia. They want to know who their surgeon is. They want to know if they'll wake up at the end of the procedure and if they won't wake up in the middle of the procedure. Is that because we're not educating people about it? So is it that they don't care or they don't understand that they need to care? They don't understand that they need to care. But the problem is, how much can we say? Well, there's a segue. So, so one of the how much can we lead, say? Well, that's a great thing. So, one of the the lead patient advocates uh, in, in, in the group listened to the first presentations, and they got us to pause. And they said, "Hang on a second. I think what you're telling me is you, you've all got guidelines that are sort of universal that says part of your responsibility is to look after my my blood pressure, my hemodynamic stability." That's what you do. You've then gone on to tell me that almost everyone is not hitting that measure. And that increases the chances of me having long-term harm. I think we should talk about this. That's a reasonable challenge. No, no. The logic is linear. (laughs) Um, And and, um, ripe for discussion. When and how do we have that discussion in this country? Are people willing to? I just, I just find it so hard that we're willing to have that and, discussion. And, and will, 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 will the next patient like ask me? I, I want to look at my intraoperative anesthesia chart after I wake up from anesthesia, right? Because I mean, if a few minutes of hypotension increases the risk of myocardial injury by about thirty percent, then you know, then great. Then my anesthesia chart is going to go to our friendly neighborhood attorney, and and then you know that that's the the end of that. But I still feel that. You know, just for the fear of litigation or the fear of being in trouble, we're trying to not educate people. That is not the best way of doing this. Yes, we have to make people understand that there's a risk, but we are there to handle the risk, right? Um, Are we willing to take that responsibility and do something about it? Wow, we opened up so many interesting (laughs) can of worms here. Let me me grab one swim lane and just sort of go down that road. I'm going to sort of back off from the... Um, fear of litigation as cause yeah. and just simply say a burden or responsibility to do our best um, because we're all smart, we're all well-intended and we're all trying to do our best. But sometimes people get hypotensive. Um, when that happens, not from cause of bad behavior, but when that happens, do we have a burden or responsibility to tell our patients because if, if the data are what the data are, do we have a burden of responsibility to tell our patients? What are your thoughts on that? It's a great question. Um, <laughs> um, again, it, if I knew how to word it appropriately, and if I knew I had the right audience, um, and I had some guardrails, 
where I, you know, I didn't have to say too much. Or I had to say just enough. Then I would probably say it. It's like me. So, so I practice mostly critical care. It's like me having a conversation with the family afterwards, saying such and such and such issue is going on with your family member. They're not going to do well, right? It's a similar discussion. Your family member had hemodynamic instability in the operating room. There is a likelihood that they might have some renal injury in the days to follow. We're going to do our best in the perioperative period to to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and that's probably how I would word it. I, I, I don't know how it would go down, though, right? I mean, I, you know, and I haven't the, done it yet. That's well, what the patients and patient representatives were saying that they thought we should do. <coughs> they said that they thought we had, and this document's published. We can people can read it and the inputs. And they, they were saying, well, you, you have a duty of candor. You know, you, you certainly do in the UK and Europe. You know, we have a, a requirement, a duty of candor to be open and honest about what happened. And they said, you know, don't, don't be fearful of coming up and saying, despite our best efforts, your blood pressure was lower than we'd hoped for periods during this. And as a result of that, we're going to track your kidney function closely and we're going to let your family practitioner know that you need to be followed up. But let me you know. let me just introduce something else into all of this. Who has this conversation at your institution and my institution and, and at my previous institution? It's still mostly the surgeons, right? They will mm-hmm. go out and meet the family members and say, oh, you know, something happened. And I hope a lot of surgeons don't tune into this. Oh, you know, something happened. <laughs> oh, the anesthesia team told me that the blood pressure was really low for a oh, while gosh. or something happened. And some, so it turns into more of a blame it on anesthesia. I'm the surgeon. I'm talking to you about this. Can we step back for change and say, I am the anesthesiologist. I am going to talk to you about hypotension because I deal with it and I will okay. obviously take responsibility. So we're going to take a time out for a second just in case people have just joined us. We're not suggesting that we should do this. No. We should, <laughs> no, no. We're suggesting that we've been challenged to think, think about, about yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. This special program was put out to remind you about the ASA, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and their annual general meeting, Anesthesiology 2022. We're all excited. Our bags are all packed, and we will be covering the conference here on Top Med Talk and on live.ebpom.org. Exclusive immediate access to our content, live.ebpom.org. Make sure you sign up now. Don't forget to check out the show notes to this podcast where we have links to all of the podcasts from which our clips have been taken. And of course, check out asahq.org as well to find out more about the American Society of Anesthesiologists.